Right, we're in the usual warm up period. Any um, thing you have to add to the uh, minutes now is a good moment to add it. If you want to add yourself to the list of attendees, that would be a great time as well. Again, we'll be starting in a moment. Please um, go to the um, uh, meeting minutes and uh, add your name and any meeting comment, any meeting points you would like to make as well. And we'll get through the get through those as we get. I'll just paste the link in chat. Okay, and uh, we're off. Um, so um, I trust I was out of the country. I am out of the country, in fact. So it made it a little difficult for me to attend some of the KubeCon stuff that was going on last week. But um, just as a matter of interest for those of you who were there or who were paying attention online, um, any comments that you want to raise on that? Any interesting feedback, any thoughts? Well, we missed uh, having you there. Um, a lot of the stuff had gone virtual, so there were definitely a lot of people missing. Um, but uh, the big theme, uh, at least from my vantage point, seemed to be a focus on uh, to be a focus on supply chain defense. Mm. And I think that this is something that 
we will be able to uh, capitalize on the long run, despite the fact like it's not the main focus of this working group. Um, but some of the things that go on through that may end up uh, gaining usage in our little area of the uh, of, of the world over time. Mm. Yes, I agree. I mean, the work I've been doing, um, you know, within Cisco, oddly, for the last couple of weeks has been supply chain defense work as well, or at least discussions, um, you know, um, how you ensure that the thing you are running is the thing that your developer produced for you and that it didn't get tampered with on the way. And I think actually we mentioned that in one of the sessions that we had. Um, I mean, there would seem to be no consolidation and two standards available for how it's done. And I think it depends on what you consider to be end-to-end -end security, as in when is the very last moment at which you can check the contents of a container image to ensure that it's what you intended to run, or I would guess a Helm chart or anything else that's involved in making these things work. Yeah, and this is definitely going to get broken up into multiple problems. The very first problem is uh, going to be how to define what's in your what's in your uh, artifacts and uh, to do this recursively with the vendors you bring in as well. So uh, mm. you as your, uh, I mean, not you as a human, but uh, you as the company uh, produce a artifact and then you can say, well, these are the things that we brought in and here's the evidence of what of what uh, they brought in and so on and so on until you've hit some bottom turtle somewhere uh, that represents the actual uh, the actual leaves of the of the graph. Um, and I think part of it is uh, a lot of people will and rightly so point out that oh this doesn't solve the supply chain security and they're right but it is it is a component that can lead into building a strategy to uh, to help uh, raise the bar and, and the cost of performing an attack. And so over time, uh, these particular artifacts would feed into more dynamic systems, like things to work out, like what's currently running in your infrastructure, as opposed to where, where was this thing built? And should I, should I gatekeep on it based upon uh, a CVE database that eventually gets populated so that you can gather what your, what your risk is over time and try to work out how to prioritize your resources to make sure that you uh, upgrade things over uh, um, in, in, a, in an efficient way. So, so I don't think it'll solve all the problems up and down the board, but if it helps people better make use of their resources in that process, uh, it certainly does move the, move the needle. Well, I have one question there. Um an audience participation question, I think. Um, between the people who are, you know, developing a CNF and putting it together and the components they use within that CNF and the people who are running the CNF, um, whose responsibility is it to make sure that the CNF is built of suitably secure, reliable components? Yeah, and, and that's a good question. And I, I don't think there's going to be a single answer for that. Um, I think that we're going to have a, uh, there's a couple things to, to look at because one of them is I may have a set of artifacts and I, I may say I brought this thing in, but how do you know that I follow the process and that I haven't injected something in the middle of that process through uh, a compiler that's been infected or, um, or someone just attests uh, through a, through a key that's been stolen. So there, there's a, there are definitely gaps that are there. There are some things that you can bring together to try to help towards this. Like you may say, oh, well, we're gonna use a repeatable, a repeatable build. And we're going to repeat that build across multiple systems that have different owners. So you may, so I mean, you could do something like that. But of course that drives the cost up. So it, it depends entirely on how much you're you're willing to do towards making that end meet and how much people are willing to spend because every control you bring in has a has a cost you can look at uh things like the recent executive order of of the u.s administration about uh, software bill of materials where um, it's mandated that every software supplier will provide a software bill of materials with all those dependencies uh, of the software when they provide. I think it's currently 
uh, addresses uh, suppliers of software to the federal government, but I think uh, that can um, be adopted widely in the industry. So I think there's some responsibility of the software vendor, but probably it won't end there. And that would be just one step of, uh, of, of securing the end-to-end -end, um, supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the executive order also calls out uh, critical infrastructure. So if you're running a power plant or something similar there, the question becomes, what is critical infrastructure? The question that I do not know the answer to is, uh, the, is, is service providers, are service providers going to be considered critical infrastructure? And if so, when are they going to be considered critical infrastructure? Because they may expand it over time as well. And if it is, at least in the United States, then the software bill of materials will be a necessary uh, deliverable for, uh, for them to accept the, the software. So but the problem uh, with that is that, um, I mean, it depends who you're working with. Um, if you are using an open source CNF, then in all likelihood, you have to build it and the CNF bill of materials is under your control. Or alternatively, if you're not building it, if you're pulling a built item off of the internet, then the supply chain security is completely out of your control. You've literally no idea what anyone built it from. Um, it's impossible to audit. If you're using a closed source CNF, which almost certainly is built from multiple components, is your supplier necessarily gonna to want to tell you every single version and every single patch of every single thing that they are using to build that? Because there's a certain quantity of intellectual property in that, along with a, a lot of actual hard work to make it possible as well, to be honest. So, is it appropriate in all circumstances or is it actually making more work and more difficulty than it would otherwise be to basically say it is your job to ensure your supply chain security and you know via contractual terms um, we indemnify ourselves against your flaws i, I think yeah. the, the recent executive order doesn't leave it as an honor system but mandates the vendors to provide this software bill of materials so it's not up to their discretion whether they want to disclose it or not. They're, I mean, of course, as you said, Ian, it's not their interest and they might be reluctant to do so, but I think this executive order exactly enforces that. It, it makes them uh, provide this bill of material. I, I, I missed the context of the executive order, sorry. Um, which executive order? So the executive order is, I don't know exactly what's the scope of it, what software it covers, but it mandates that software vendors provide a software bill of material with, with the software they provide. I think it may be limited right now to critical infrastructure, but uh, it mandates software vendors to uh, accompany their provided software with the software bill of material indicating all the, the components included in, in this software product. Yeah, the, the first turn of the crack, uh, crank is if the, if the government buys your software, uh, you must provide a, a software bill of materials. And uh, they, my understanding is they're putting that as a full stop measure. So it, it will be a, a hard requirement if we're at least selling into the US government. Mm, but, it, but yeah, I mean, specifically for selling into the US government, to be clear. Right, that's not that that's US specific and it's US government specific. It's not the market that we're dealing with. Um, right. the, the second it could be thing. adopted by the market we're dealing with. But again, the question I'm asking myself here is will that stop people providing software under those terms? Would they simply refuse to do it? Or would it would they be, you know, their ability to provide good software or innovative software be stifled by doing it? I, I don't know the answers to these. And you might say that I've got a, you know, um, a stake in this, that I don't want to be providing this stuff. And it's true, I don't, but that's a personal thing. It just seems like a lot of work for actually not a great deal of value. But, um, you know, it, it's, um, I don't know what the right answer is, which gets the best result for all of us. That's my question. Maybe yeah, I can I think... add a little bit on that one in general. Hi, by the way, CJ joined this meeting for the first time, but have a background in a lot of telco and work with some of the larger vendors in that topic, as well as a lot of the open source stuff. You know, one of the things that I've noticed when talking to some of these kind of larger vendors is that 
what they are really pushing right now as a competitive advantage is this controlled supply chain because they have no interest at all in showing their source code, which means that mm. they've added a lot of work from the black duck to the FOSS ID to all these kind of source code scanning and you know safe repositories and a lot of process would be able to do that one. And that will be a lot of their competitive advantage when it comes to selling these, let's call it black box CNFs which has some specific connections up to the management system so that they, through that system, can validate that that happens. For the open source or the more mixed ones, exactly as you've all been saying now, it's going to be really tricky to do a similar type of source code scanning or secured repositories that you have to check into, especially if there are projects that are using you know, tons of different supply chain pieces, like we can expect. So my view on this would probably be that, you know, you have to have a way of securing an open source supply chain. But in the proprietary supply chain, you know, this has been something that had been worked on for five or six or seven years for competitive reasons to push this thing in, to make it as we're fe feeling right now in a very complex position of how it needs to be done. Does this make sense? It sort of does, but I mean, the thing that I come back to is, okay, so I found, well, I, I can think of two problems here. One is that the idea that there is a single best version of some component, right? If I, I pick a random source component off, off the shelf, say libc, is it? Um, there will be, you know, a glibc that exists in the upstream repository, there will be a version that Red Hat ships, which will be older than that and will be patched up to hell because that's what they do. There will be a version that Canonical ship that is older than that and patched up to hell because that's what they do. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that I see that there is a clear end to that supply chain, the source in this instance. The other problem I can see is that actually you know, as a company trying to deliver something that's in this instance, we're looking at security, but reliability comes into this as well. Let's go with security for a second. As a uh, an operator of CNFs, I'm actually not as interested in where is this software coming from as who stands behind it, who is the responsible party if it turns out that there is a problem in this. Um, and I might be able to get a jump on my suppliers being terrible responsible parties if they if I am auditing the components of their software, but I'm not going to go back to the GNU project for glibc and say, well, you know, you broke my application and I lost millions of dollars and now I'm going to sue you. That isn't what's going to happen here. So, I mean, in the sense of this being a potential best practice, I think the question is, how, what could you possibly get? out of this what's the what's the maximal value you can get out of having a well-traced supply chain yeah and, but Dan, don't and you want is, to be aware of, of sorry if I, uh, uh, go ahead uh, yeah I'll, I'll tack on something real quick on that and then please uh, continue uh there is a they do differentiate in the uh stand the standard ones that are catching on uh, they do differentiate between the creator and the supplier and uh, it does provide for path to provide that. So you might say the creator is GNU, uh, the supplier is Red Hat, and Red Hat is the one responsible for the contents of this. So there, there is something for that. Yeah, what I wanted to say is that even, I mean, if there is a vulnerability discovered in glibc, don't you want to know if you're affected or not as, as the operator? But on the other hand, um, if I'm trusting the vendor to tell me what glibc they're using and be right. And why am I not trusting the vendor to tell me that they're not affected? It's a good question, but I think up until now, it was um, not much of a motivation for the vendor to you know, constantly uh, check for all these vulnerabilities. If it's now out there in the SBOM and, and they know they're under scrutiny, mm -hmm. they have more incentive maybe to make sure they're covered and that that all and these CVs as are one of those vendors i have to say that you know my company's finances are on the line if something like that happens so i mean and i'm not 
in terms of future sales, but in terms of typically current liabilities. But it, it, it depends. I don't know the answer to this. I'm not arguing a corner here. I'm trying to get to the bottom of the question, to be clear. Yeah, I, I'm not saying there was malice in uh, from the side of the vendor. I, I've been working for vendors for 30 years now, but um, and, and there is never, to my knowledge, any malice or, or uh, uh, active hiding of vulnerabilities, but maybe having an SBOM there and, and having both the vendor and, and their customers be aware of that will make, you know, drive both parties to be more uh, aware of vulnerabilities earlier. And that's all. It's not like, you know, holding someone accountable to something they weren't accountable for before, but just providing a tool and a common language to, to have that discussion between the supplier and the vendor. Yeah, and, and I think part of it is where they're trying to shift responsibilities. Like before, responsibility was entirely on the vendors. And after getting burned by uh, various attacks like solar winds, uh, the one that attacks solar winds, the government, I think, is trying to push some of the responsibility. Like if there's a problem, and then you should own it. Step one of ownership is like, let's go trust the vendors and tell them, hey, you need to do something about it. If that fails, you still own the problem. So let's move it up the stack and get more, more control. So I think it's, I think part of this is a reaction to the various attacks where a company like Cisco may be an extremely good actor in this space, but because there's a large number of vendors out there who may not be as mature in their processes, they need a way to force that maturity. And part of it is not just about security as in where does it come from. If you cannot produce an, an SBOM, that could be an indicator that uh, from a process perspective, you're you're not mature and you actually don't know where your software comes from internally. So yeah. but, uh, part of what, it is what if process. I produce what if I produce an SBOM and it's not right? Absolutely. Because these that's, things have to be trust, by, trust and verify, right? You 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 can't um you know if somebody's giving me an s bomb then that's effectively me you know making sure i can verify their claims that they're auditing for security problems in potential source components uh, and interestingly oh. we've moved a little way away from supply chain security here but still um but i mean if they give me an s bomb and that s bomb is a lie or a fiction or out of date or simply made by tools that get it wrong then I don't know that I necessarily have a means of validating that the bomb that they give me is the bomb as it truly is in practice. Yeah, and the issue of getting it right, if it's a mistake, like your your <coughs> produces output that's just wrong. I mean, that's one thing. If it's somebody who's lying uh, purposely on that, then they risk being caught. And then it's, it's uh, literally illegal and they can then add on the appropriate uh consequences for that uh, but that is definitely it's a damage. major risk yeah that, that's definitely a major risk is like uh from an s-bomb perspective what if the tools don't produce the right output or the person doesn't configure it in the right way to to do so so a large part of this i think is going to be hinged on uh how easy is it to use the tools and um, how mature do those tools become over over time and it, it's definitely it is it's definitely a major risk especially now in, in the earlier days and doesn't this go down almost into the development tool chain that, you know, let's say there is a vulnerability somewhere in the code. You know, there are two ways that a company can do that. Either they are extremely strict with what code they let in and, you know, they only use their own code or they have this kind of qualification process that gives you six months old libraries because that was when the last library was kind of checked. And then they can kind of build that application in their lab in a day and they're absolutely sure that there are no vulnerabilities and that it works or you do the other way that you let all these developers bring in their old all the cool code bring something that works and then you start with the source code st scanning the application monitoring you're basically running it in test environment that the customer that process takes a month before you can certify it and say yeah yeah this thing actually works and I'm guessing that that second option that a lot of the larger vendors have been doing doesn't really work well when you're having thousands of different components that can go wrong in various times. But the old, the other option of actually securing e each and every component that goes into that supply chain 
is also quite complex because then you're stuck in the fact that you're actually you know using old components with bugs and security fixes that might have been fixed in upstream versions a lot faster right mm -hmm. These things are all potentially true. And I think the other thing that's always missed is that just because there's a CVE on glibc as an example, again, right, if it's in a function I don't call, then it's irrelevant. Um, so um, security problems with components built into a system do not necessarily respect security problems with the system. They are a question mark. They are not absolutely. So what you're almost saying is that we should segment the type of CNFs and the type of functions, if there are communication functions to the rest of the world or through other processes, or if they contain these, let's call it larger attack surfaces, while other CNFs might be, you know, less valuable in that regard. Yeah, and part I, of it as well is that one. Yeah, and part of it is also determining where to spend your resources. Like you're running a, an infosec team, you have limited resources, limited time to do any given task. So if uh, this gives you a roadmap of being able to ask the vendors, hey, can you validate this, verify it for me, uh, versus uh, not knowing where to, where to spend some of, some, of your, uh, some of your time. And also to also look at the, the updates, like someone comes over and says, we, we made a patch with, uh, with glibc and this has gone into our systems. Then uh, it also gives an opportunity to put out bug bounties for those things and say, hey, we patched this particular thing, or we want to prove that this thing is not vulnerable to this CVE because we believe it's been cauterized. Uh, if you can find a path that uses that particular code path or use exercises that feature, then you get a much larger bounty than the normal bounty. So I think that there's some interesting economic um, advantages that we, can, that we can gain here that are beyond just, does this thing make it more, more secure? Yeah, but coming back to our job, if we were recommending in this instance, perhaps an interaction between the way that a, a developer chooses and incorporates components and the way that an operator needs to assure that the running system, you know, the, the actual CNF they've been given is secure, what best practices and again, they don't have to be perfect and they don't have to be comprehensive. They just have to be things that we can write down. What best practices could we possibly write down that we would all agree are as good as it's getting at this point in time? So um, I've spent a little bit of time looking at some of these things. I can write up a, a, an initial draft of what such a best practice would look like. And in the beginning, it'll primarily be uh, use one of the tools that, that analyzes the incoming packages, the incoming artifacts, generates uh, an SPDX or Cyclone DX, either is fine, and, uh, and signs it. If you're in the open source world, uh, use something like SigStore. You can use that with closed source as well, but, uh, but basically you have something that is assigned at a point in time that you can then provide to other, that you can then provide downstream. And just has a first turn of the crank. Uh, other turns over time will become more, um, ideally more easy to produce something, um, but also more rich in, in the information that it provides, but just as a first turn of the crank. And this is actually what uh, they did in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes now has, uh, is now producing SPDX um, as part of, of their builds. And those, uh, I, I don't know if they're being signed in six story yet. Uh, if it's not, I, my understanding is that's the goal. And uh, I know the people who wrote that code as well. So I'm happy to go ping them um, and see if we can get them to come in and give some advice. And I just wanted to add one thing to what you said is about the artifact. I think there is various types of artifact and you might have a different way to scan or uh, basically review the, the, the vulnerabilities in each of them, depending on the type. Yeah, what's interesting with this is we don't want the vulnerability information directly in the, uh, in the, uh, the SBOM. We want it to be something that can, or the SBOM can act as a key to those vulnerabilities. And so that's because the vulnerabilities over time, they, they, the, they change, they tend, they tend to grow. So. Uh, the SBOM is designed to be a, a static element that you build, you sign, 
um, and it never changes from uh, from then on. Ian, if you can hear us, we saw the message on the chat. Yeah, and... it's back again. Sorry about that. It's uh, it's going to be intermittent because I am in the middle of nowhere in the UK and uh, it, it uh, leaves you with um, rural internet problems. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, I, I trust you're riffing on the concept. But OK, Frederick, you've just signed up for um, this part of things, what we could do in terms of bill of materials of software built into a CNF. Um, as I say, I think, you know, it becomes a broader topic of working out whether the software in question and any given category of vulnerability on that software actually makes the CNF vulnerable in turn, which isn't always a given. Um, the supply chain stuff back to the, you know, the build product making its way from whoever developed it to production running code without being maliciously modified or its configuration being maliciously modified. Um, those also exist. Um, and I, I think we mentioned earlier that yes, there are a couple of signing solutions out there. Um, one thing I have as a question at the moment is whether any of those signing solutions or perhaps how far those signing solutions go to end-to-end -end security because Again, if I take a container and I store its tarball on my you know, target node and that tarball is changed at some point in time by whoever, then when it's unpacked and it's run, then it could, it's been tampered with. It's no longer what I intend it to be. So there are questions there about how far from an end-to-end -end perspective you can take that. Um, and obviously the start is the same question, right? If I'm building something, then it, the signature of a container is typically um, calculated by my build system, but what goes into that build before it's signed is, um, you know, potentially um, alterable. So same kind of thing with that security. It's almost the question of how do I ensure that the bomb that we're talking about here actually is what's reflected by a signed component. Um, again, more questions than answers in my head at this point in time. Yeah, and these also, these are uh, some of the conversations that we're going to have in time, like you could have a, there has to be somewhere where some entity uh, is performing that attestation and absorbing the risk and saying like, I as company X uh, declare that this thing is, uh, is accurate to the best of our knowledge and that they followed some process. And they may even be required to, to provide in the long run some process information on how something was built, uh, which they could do with something like Intoto, uh, which basically says, I followed this process as, I am this role and I followed this process. And you can define the various roles that led up to it. Uh, but the end result is that there has to be something there that you can that you can anchor to, and if it's open source, you're pulling in that that entity is absorbing the risk of having selected those open source tools and ensuring that the source code coming in is uh, uh, is to the best of their knowledge uh, uh, low 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 risk uh, to to the to the customers, and uh, part of part of doing that as well. Um, there's another risk that, that we need to be careful with, and I want to flag this. Uh, it's we want to make sh one of the things, and I'm going to be going around the uh, the circuit uh, talking about the specific uh, the specific thing. Uh, we want to make sure that the entity that is considered to be responsible or assigning for it 
is a uh, is a, a company and not necessarily the name of a human. And so the company may maintain an internal list of of uh, names, but we don't want the legal name to be part of, of the humans to be within the the S bomb itself. And the reason I, why... I think your point would be that it's a responsible party. I mean, someone who exactly. holds responsibility, whether that is a company or a human. The fact well, is that you know exactly, you know who, who's neck to. Right, but but the reason we don't really? want it to be explicitly a human is that that causes a risk for when for nation the... state actors to to target like which humans do I need to go shake down in order to uh, make a change. So if it's like uh, if it's a large vendor uh, or a vendor of a company, you don't you, you don't have that roadmap but you trust the company maintains that. Oh, that's going to be hard with curl since I know Daniel Stenberg that does that little module. Yeah, but even with curl, like uh, you have the individual who makes it when Red Hat pulls it in, uh, they have people who are responsible for ensuring that the software that comes into the platform is, uh, is yeah. Yeah. So separate the two things, right? It's not who does the work, it's who's standing up to say that this works on pain of, you know, me losing money and paying it to you, this works. That's what it always comes down to. That's what responsibility is, that the consequences land somewhere. Um, they don't just fly around and ultimately if you haven't, it's a form of insurance in a sense. Um, if I'm running a CNF and it uses curl, and I don't check curl and I get it from a vendor who makes no promises about the quality of it, or I just pulled it off the internet, then when it breaks, then all of the consequences land on me. I bought that for myself. If you think that that is not what you're doing, if you think you've got a vendor on the hook, you're saying that you need someone to effectively find in blood that they're on the hook, saying when you want to see a responsible name in the bomb. And then what you're saying in addition is you would normally find that was a company, not a person. So it's the fixing liability, not the uh, you know economical liability for the damage. It's both normally. I mean, it, I, I want to know the the liability for it not working is not for us to choose, or at least we could, to be fair, make recommendations because that's precisely what we do. But it, it isn't necessarily for us to make the final choice. If somebody says, "Well, it's all right as long as it's to fix it within five days." Then yeah, that, that's great. If that's what you choose, then oh, you know, knock yourself out. Um, there are plenty of people running, you know, production networks who would say, uh, if my network goes down for more than ten minutes, then I will be charging you a million dollars an hour or whatever. Um, but again, the the actual nature of the contract is fine and good. It's really just a matter of saying, I got this from you, and I can prove that I am running exactly the thing you shipped, which means that you are in fact liable for all of its failings. Exactly. And then you have those, um, you know, ten or twenty larger companies that are the only ones that can in play play in that kind of game. But it is, you know, pay a million when something goes wrong, which of course the end customers are the operators. Well, yeah, again, they don't you, want to you, pay you, that extra got... penalty, yeah. but they still want to have that flexibility. And who who needs to take that risk? Right, and and this is the nature of things like clouds, for instance, that you can build a. A, a reliable network from unreliable components or a reliable piece of whatever you call a cloud from unreliable components. I don't necessarily guarantee that the cloud, the, the individual servers work perfectly and forever. I guarantee that the cloud works perfectly forever when built from those less reliable components. So, I mean, a an operator of software or anything else is effectively not saying um, that the software that they've been given in much the same way as routers die eventually. They're not saying that the components they've been given are perfectly reliable and will live forever and will work perfectly. They're saying that they can deal with whatever consequences are left after the guarantees they've been given. Exactly, and if they have the source code, worst case- And that if, you're going with, if you're going with, yeah. So, so basically, we're getting even more into a kind of supply chain risk management thinking here, where we should basically say, you know, five or six different categories for components. Do they talk with the outside world? You know, do they have more than than this many type of libraries? Do they have, uh, you know, 
components connected to sign on or author authorization. So we could basically create a bit of a you know risk management matrix based on a few things that you know do have an impact if they are affecting other components in that secure chain of insecure components. Mm. If yeah, it, it, it comes down to I, I would take this from there is a big picture to solve, and that big picture is going to take some solving um, in terms of, all right, when I bring all of these exciting components together, then where do the risks get the biggest risks get introduced and how do I mitigate them? But we can also take it from the other way around, right? You said that it is useful to have a manifest for a CNF. Um, even if it, all it says is, hello, I am CNF version 145, but it might also say, and I'm built of these things. And it is important that that manifest ties back with a signature because it's the only secure way of doing this to someone who owns the thing, the CNF, um, and some degree of responsibility on the CNF. So we know that manifest is signed and we know that the thing that the manifest refers to is also signed to avoid tampering and change. We could probably put best practices together around that, which is, you know, there will be a manifest file. It will contain at least, and it may also contain this sort of thing. Um, I would, you know, I don't think you can solve the world problems. I think if you could, then we've effectively solved problems in a lot of other industries besides our own. But I think you could at least nibble away at the corners, right? There needs to be a manifest. It will contain these things. We will pick a random format and we will call this a best practice for the time being. And it gives us a place to improve upon when we think of other things we want to add. That's a bit of 80-20 on it and basically saying that we cannot secure everything since we are a communication setup and we cannot go to a total, you know, uh, zero trust because of course the components need to be able to talk to each other. Mm. Yeah, well, indeed, the internet talks to them. It'd be very bad now. Yeah, for some strange reason, right? For the most part. Yeah. So, I mean, all, all I'm saying is, um, and oddly, this is a pitch that I, I seem to borrow the same pitches internally and externally, but it's, it's something I've been saying to other people internally this week, is it is not important to get to, to understand your end goal and to write it down as a piece. It's important to write down the start of this in a way that you can add to it. So my thinking here is if we know there's going to be a manifest, if we know there's going to be signing, why don't we talk about the bits that we know rather than worry about how to use them to you know make the perfect solution so that we can build from them so that we've got something to change as opposed to a document to write from scratch well there's usually a lot of vocal people on here um, and in fact i think it's been me and frederick and maybe cj that have been doing all the talk today so i should probably apologize but um uh, anyone want to pitch in on that are we going anywhere in the right direction with this i think there were some good uh, there was a good discussion here and one thing to remember it's not just our problem it's uh, as frederick mentioned uh the kubernetes community as a whole needs to deal with it or the software industry as a whole needs to deal with it so we don't I, i'm feeling that we don't have a, a very good solutions right now, but at least we are aware of the problem. So I think as mm -hmm. we make progress, uh, we should keep an eye open to towards the rest of the industry and what kind of best practices emerge there and see what makes sense to adopt from, from the community at large. Mm. I, I agree that this is not exclusively our problem. And we definitely do want to be keeping the ear to the ground for better answers. Yes. Anyone else? Victor, you usually have something to say on the subject. Or Oliver, Olivier. Okay, running scared, All right. Um, now, Again, my network is terrible, but at the moment I am looking at the, um, uh, the agenda and I'm seeing that we've run out of agenda. So did anyone have anything else they wanted to raise today? Um, mark your calendars for Detroit next year for KubeCon. Um, I know it's a long way out, but uh, it's a really great place to, to visit.
Do you have a date? Um, I don't know if dates have been published or not. Um, some sometime this time frame as as usual. Okay, um, get writing your papers now. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> they they've been pushing the uh, the CFPs earlier and earlier because of the uh, the size. So. Hello. Oh, welcome back. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. All right. Um, again, if there is anything else, then now is your moment. Otherwise, I will give you the last sort of 10 or 12 minutes back and uh, you can go on with your days. Cool. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, see you next week. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'll see you all next week. Thanks, bye.